Ladies and gentlemen, uh, social scientists and, and any others here, uh, my name's Malcolm Gillies. I'm the uh, Vice Chancellor here at the uh, uh, at, uh, London Metropolitan University. Um, we have just an hour to accomplish a lot. Uh, we're delighted to have the uh, roadshow of the campaign coming to, to us at London Met. Uh, I'm going to say some introductory things. We're then going to hear from, from Michael Harlow uh, and from Caridwin Roberts. And then after that, we have question and answers. Uh, they're going to be chaired by Brian Hall in the absence uh, of, um, of John Gabriel. So I hope you'll find that this is a, a jam-packed uh, lunch, uh, lunch and then following on to uh, and, um, a meeting that's going to be full of ideas and comments. Um, I wanted to come along and talk with you because I think this campaign is hugely important. I think it's uh, also self-evident that at London Met, social sciences and humanities uh, is a strong field and it's one that we have to make sure that we keep strong. I observed from a recent survey of how students are enrolled across British universities that by one measure 63% of students are studying in one or other field of humanities, social sciences or the arts. And when you hear some of our policies and you look at some of the distributions of government money, you might think that that was not the case at all. Uh, but strong advocacy helps to explain why over three out of every five students would be studying something which fundamentally deals with the human condition rather than dealing with things and the way things may work. Um, I'm very proud that we have maintained a diverse array of subjects in the uh, broad area of social sciences and humanities at London Met, despite many of our recent challenges. We recognise that this has often been hard, but what's important for us is not just that we have that broad array, but that we make sure that it ties in with the areas in which we both teach and research, so that there's an understanding of the nexus between those two, but it ties in with the demand that emerges in the short and the long term from the students, and that it also ties in with the opportunities that there can be for competitive grants, either within Britain or the European Union, uh, and also the strong needs of the public. I can't think of a field more strong in terms of grey literature than the social sciences. And that grey literature both needs to be recognised as being a research equivalent output, but absolutely important that it inform public policy. So we have a lot of policies that are better than a lot of current policies we have to deal with. Um, I'd like to say, having been the president both of the uh, Australian Academy of Science, um, sorry, the Australian Academy of the Humanities, back about 13 years ago, but also having been the inaugural president of the uh, Council for Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences in Australia, that I applaud very much the strong advocacy push that you have. The objectives uh, to make sure that social sciences are critical to government policy, to giving advice at the highest of levels, to making informed submissions <coughs> to government, to making sure that data sets uh, really given the honour that they need and the recent census release of the 2011 census is an absolutely fascinating but also absolutely essential document for any nation and one with an illustrious history. Informing the media because it needs to be informed uh, and also making sure that we have a breadth and a depth of research somewhere in the country to meet the various social needs. But I do think there's one thing which was missing in the document. I was looking for more emphasis upon business and industry and employers, tying in with the fact that these are often major opinion formers, particularly for right-wing governments. I'm not sure we've got a right-wing government at the moment, but we've got one that sometimes veers that way. And therefore very important that all the major stakeholders in society appreciate they have their role to play in keeping social sciences very strong and vibrant and making sure that the social science voice is heard at all the tables. Uh, industry is particularly important in that, and bodies like the CBI are very important and listened to by governments as they formulate policies and formulate their strategies for elections. The 2012 annual report that many of you may have seen and circulated around with information for this meeting, I found uh, a very strong document in putting forward the aims of stronger social sciences, uh, which influence government, which cause a more coherent sense of presentation 
to all those stakeholders and a confidence in speaking out, not to hide behind the academic veil but bust right through that to show there's nothing more informed than strong academically relevant and research sanctioned studies in driving things such as policy or changes in practice. But also in acting behind the scenes where many of the most important discussions occur. In short, what I'd like to say <coughs> is that I think this initiative shows that the future of the world is every bit as social as it is scientific, technological or medical. And that all of those advances in those fields themselves only rest upon effective social targeting and selling stories to human beings. To put it this way, that the uptake of medical and technological innovation depends so much upon social practice mm -hmm. and also that even the making of science teaching effective ultimately depends upon tying up what goes on in the classroom with real lives of real people living in real time. So I'd just like to applaud the initiative. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing from our next two speakers. And unfortunately, I will start to, to move away in the question and answers for two reasons. One, because I do have an engagement then. But two, I want you to feel you can speak completely freely about the way you're seeing social sciences in this university at this time. So um, I'd now like to hand over to Michael. Malcolm, thank you very much. And um, I'd like to thank you and the university for your support for the campaign for social science and for your very interesting and in some places challenging remarks which I've taken on board, particularly the issue of business and industry. And we might come back to that in the discussion session later. Just to tell you a little bit about who we are, as Malcolm said, I'm Michael Harlow. I'm acting chair of the campaign for social science. Until 2009, I was vice chancellor of the University of Salford. And before that, I was dean of social sciences and then Pro Vice-Chancellor at the University of Essex. Caredwin, Caredwin Roberts, is a Senior Research Officer in Social Policy at the University of Oxford. She's on the board of our campaign, and um, uh, she was also Chair of the Social Research Association. Uh, well, you've got all got a copy of our annual report, which has just been published, and you won't have had a chance to read it yet, but please do take it away and have a look at it. Um, in it, you'll find details of the aims of the campaign, who's involved in running it, what we're doing, and who the campaign's uh, main supporters are. The supporters of the campaign include a growing number of universities, and more have joined up since the report went to print, all the main social science publishers, over 20 learned societies in the social sciences, and we're delighted recently the Joseph Roundtree Trust has also decided to give us support as well. I don't want to spend time going through all of this in detail, but we'll be happy to answer questions on any of it later on. Um, instead, I just want to outline the reasons why we think the campaign's necessary and touch on a little bit of what we're doing. Then Corregwin will add a very few brief comments on particular aspects of our work. But as I say, we want to leave enough time for a Q&A session. The campaign aims to raise the profile of social science to the public in uh, the media and parliament. It was launched uh, in the House of Lords just over a couple of years ago, and this is one of a series of sessions we've been holding at universities up and down the country to introduce the, co uh, the campaign to our colleagues in the social sciences, to seek your views on what the key issues are and how we should shape the campaign and seek your continuing support for the work we've now started. So we do really want to hear from you. Well, I've said that the campaign aims to raise the a profile of social science uh, to the public. But the fact that we need to do so seems odd, given that the news media is full of raw material for social science. I could go through the BBC news webpage today and pick out half a dozen stories that are linked to issues that are social scientific issues. Um, so there's lots of raw material for social science and the media frequently engages social scientists in helping journalists to make sense of it all. At the launch of the campaign, our president Howard Newby reflected on this and suggested that we in the social sciences are now in a situation where the science, technology, engineering and maths, the STEM subjects were about 15 
to 20 years ago. Then they felt undervalued and underappreciated. They recognised that there was a lack of public understanding of what the STEM disciplines contributed to society and its development. And among other responses to this, a group of scientists formed a body which was originally called Save British Science. Some of you may remember it. It's now renamed rather more um, respectfully, uh, respectably the Campaign for Science and Engineering. And anyway, it's, it's been a very effective lobbyist and publicist for STEM. Through a sustained effort to promote public understanding, not just relying on political and private lobbying, although doing that as well, the STEM scientists and the learned societies which represent them have fostered not only a higher public understanding of science, but have raised the esteem with which these disciplines are viewed, notably, though not only, in regard to their contribution to the new knowledge economy. As Howard Newby commented, of course, the new knowledge economy doesn't only depend <coughs> on STEM subjects. It also requires qualities of innovation, creativity and enterprise across all disciplines, and we need to continue to produce generations of social science researchers and graduates who can contribute to the wider knowledge economy in terms of management, design, social impact, social change, understanding the social underpinnings of new technology, new markets, and so on and so forth. Now, this is, of course, just one example of the case to be made for the social sciences, albeit the one that probably has the most resonance with government in these times, i.e. the link between research and the economy. One aspect of the relatively low profile that the social sciences have in public is its low profile in government, or their low profile in government. Central government is a major commissioner and user of social research, but nowhere currently does social science in government come together functionally in any holistic way. And in particular, there's a lack of a social science presence at the most senior levels in government. The comparison with the position of the natural sciences and engineering is instructive. Um, there are about 20 chief departmental scientific advisors, with particular briefs for advising their departments and ministers on policy development, analysis, and, scientific, and the scientific evidence base. Most of these individuals have a background in the physical life and medical sciences. And on top of that, there is, of course, also the government chief scientific advisor who heads the government office for science and advises the prime minister directly. There is no such representation of the social sciences in government at that senior level. But since the campaign started, we've been busy lobbying hard for this to change, along with others, of course. And I'm delighted to tell you that we've recently learned informally that there is going to be an announcement soon that there will be a chief social science advisor to government and I'm pretty certain this wouldn't have happened without the lobbying uh, which included things like appearances before the House of Lords Science and Technology Committee and so on that the lobbying that's gone on. So there is a second element also to the case we have to make not just the utility of the social sciences to the United Kingdom, but also they're excellent. In relation to research, I'll just refer to a recent detailed survey of the UK's international ranking. The report was issued by BIS, the Department of Business and Innovation and Skills, and it's called the International Comparative Performance of the UK Research Base 2011. And you can look at it on the BIS website if you're interested. This confirms the UK's strength in the social sciences is second only to the USA, and that in the past decade this strength has been growing. The report also contains an innovative analysis of national research that complements the citation-based analyses that the main report's based on. This creates a visual research map of the distinctive research strengths of a country that focuses on interdisciplinary outputs. For the UK, this identifies over 400 specific areas of research in which the UK is very strong by international standards. And it shows that the UK has particular clusters of excellence in the medical health sciences, the humanities, and the social sciences. This strength in research has wider implications too, for it feeds through into higher quality scholarship and teaching 
at both undergraduate and postgraduate levels, and our ability to sustain the innovative application of social science in the community and in the public and private sectors of the economy. That relates to a point that Malcolm was raising. So a principal aim of the campaign is to support and sustain the social sciences across the whole of higher education. So, um, the campaign is therefore about ensuring the public, the media and decision makers increasingly come to recognise the relevance and excellence of UK social science. And I'd just like to finish by telling you one or two of the concrete things that we're doing. But firstly, just to talk about the progress of the campaign itself, in the two years since we started, we've raised something over £300,000. That compares with the Campaign for Science and Engineering, which is supported by donations to the tune of about a quarter of a million pounds a year. So we've got some way to go to develop as adequately a funded campaign as we want, but nevertheless I think that's a pretty impressive start, particularly in the middle of a recession and when universities and everyone else is facing uh, a great deal of uncertainty. So what have we done with the money? Well, we've appointed a part-time press officer, Tony Truman, who's sitting there in the front row, and also a policy officer to develop our links with media, parliament and government. We've established uh, developing relations with ESRC, BIS, the Government Office for Science and the relevant parliamentary select committees. We also have links with the British Academy through our membership of something called the Strategic Forum for the Social Sciences, which is chaired by the BA, which brings us together with government social science and the main non-governmental social science funders such as Nuffield, Lever, Hume, Roundtree and so on. As I've already mentioned, we've been lobbying for the appointment of a chief social scientist. We're discussing with ESRC and BIS how we can best make a useful input into the work they're doing into, in the run-up to the new public expenditure review, where we will have to argue very strongly the case for social science. We'll probably have to argue it more strongly even than last time round. We're also surveying social science faculties across the country to monitor the effects of the current changes in higher education on student numbers in the social sciences at undergraduate and postgraduate levels. We've been a leader in campaigning over the overhasty and potentially damaging effects of the way in which the government adopted the recommendations of the Finch Report on Open Access Publication last year. And recently this pressure has resulted in at least a partial modification of the plans, but there's still a long way to go with this issue before the particular concerns with the social sciences and for that matter with the humanities are fully recognised. We intend to continue our survey of the effects of current changes on higher education recruitment. Well, one of the things we want to concentrate on over the next few years is also the impact that the changes at the undergraduate level are having on postgraduate recruitment. Among other work in Parliament, we're trying to influence the agenda of select committees and submitting evidence to them. And I can go into more details of that later. Uh, but I'm going to stop now. I think that gives you at least a flavour of what we're trying to achieve in broad terms with the campaign and some of the specific things we're working on. And I'm just going to pass over now to Craig Wynne, who's going to add one or two words to supplement that. Thank you, Michael. I think I see my role on the Campaign for Social Science uh, board as arguing for the applied social sciences. Though I'm currently at Oxford, I have spent most of my working life in the non-academic sector government, the voluntary sector, uh, and so on. So that, and I've been very active in one of the learned societies which represents overwhelmingly the applied social science sector, namely the Social Research Association, which is signed up to this campaign and is a, a member of the academy. So what I see, uh, I bring to the party, is in a sense saying, don't just think about the effects of the cuts on universities, think about the effects of the cuts in commissioning from government, whether it's central or local. Think about what's happening to the research functions, social science activities in the voluntary sector. All of that needs to be part of the campaign for social science. And I stress that here because I would imagine that some of your students are going into those sort of jobs. 
they or would hope to be going into those sort of jobs where they could work as research officers using their social science skills they've learned here in a whole variety of openings uh, that are essentially about applying social science to policy or practice. Um, I think the things that, that I notice now about the campaign is that it is actually widening, as you would expect, it's widening its area of concern and interest. So that we started with the university, as I said, we're now looking at what are the effects, for example, on entry to postgraduate MA courses. It's a really significantly worrying issue because many of you will know that if you want to have a career as a social scientist, you can't just stop at undergraduate level. You have to go on and, and top it up with either a master's in criminology, a master's in social research, something that uses your, your social science in public health, those sort of issues, those are some of the courses you're teaching here. And yet if people have paid a lot of money for their undergraduate training, are they going to have the money to pay for the postgraduate training that will be such an essential first step in their career move to be career social scientists as an applied or academic level. So that's something I think we're beginning to get very concerned about. Some people have said, well, do you think you ought to also be directing your interests to uh, entry into undergraduate courses? If people feel very pressured by the funding <coughs> uh, squeeze they're under, will they not be taking courses that they think will be financially more beneficial in the long run? None of us could say that you make a lot of money as a social scientist because the simple truth is you don't, uh, not compared to, say, an accountant or a lawyer, possibly. So will we be losing some of the bright young people who have historically been choosing social science um, because of that issue as well? And I think that's something that we'll begin to do much more work on, working with our learned societies about thinking about what are those implications. So I hope that gives you a feel of some of the issues that we're now looking at as the campaign has began to develop itself. I think there's one other issue that we, uh, we, we, we're concerned about, and, 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 and we've referred to it slightly, which is why don't you know, the public have so much social science in their, in their, in their face through, through issues in the media and so on. Uh, but how much misunderstanding is there about what social science does? And, and on your chair, you will find a leaflet about a series that the Academy is running as part of trying to explain to the public what, are, what, are, what is the benefit of social science. And we're taking issues of public concern. I think the ones there you've got is addiction or work to life, life to work, live to work, or work to live. Taking issues of public concern, using social scientists <coughs> to explain to the general public uh, really what's happening, because though the issues may be in the media, they aren't always reported in what you might call a social scientific way. <laughs> Far from it. So that's why we called our series Myths and Realities. But uh, those are just some of the things that I think uh, you should know about in terms of where the campaign is going and, uh, and, uh, 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 and what we'll be doing now and hope to do in the future. And I think it's very important that we do more to bring in the practitioner element, more to bring in the applied social scientists, uh, because actually uh, that's where a lot of the job opportunities are, and that's actually where quite a lot of the actual practice of social science affecting uh, policy development and policy uh, evaluation, as much as practice, uh, improving good practice, really has an impact. I think that's all I can really say at this stage.